first off, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers of the tree reading series, Colin, Deanna, Margaret. Uh, I'd like to thank you for inviting me and thank you for dinner. Um, I'd also like to thank Brick Books, of course, um, most especially Sue Sinclair, my editor, um, and of course, Kitty Lewis. Um, I guess uh, I'll start with uh, the title for this book, um, This World We Invented. I have a number of people who uh, ask me where does the title come from and, and what is that all about and who is we? <clears throat> and um, I just want to start off by saying that initially it started out as a book of poems about a neighborhood I had just moved to in Montreal called Verdun, which is in the southwest borough of Montreal. Um, I essentially moved from um, a fairly well-to-do suburb to a rather sketchy neighborhood. Um, and I was kind of trying to adapt and I began just writing a bunch of poems about the people I was seeing outside and, and the strange goings on. And around about the same time, I uh, signed up for a, an all-day free workshop that was offered by um, an art and research creation team at McGill University. Um, essentially, they were conducting this uh, day-long uh, workshop uh, to address the issue of thinking art. And I found that quite interesting. Um, didn't quite know how to react to that. Um, but the question they wanted to address was, how does art think? And to be part of that um, workshop, you had to write to them and explain why you wanted to uh, participate. Um, and then they decided whether you were in or out. And uh, it was basically six different workshops throughout the day, um, for ranging from music to uh, visual arts to architecture to poetry, etc. Um, the only condition was you were not allowed to take a workshop in an art that you were familiar with. So I couldn't take the poetry workshop. Um, and I ended up signing up for clowning which everyone kind of looks at me and says, clowning. But that's what I did. And um, basically, we spent um, the day with our group uh, working on a presentation or um, some kind of performance piece that we would show uh, or present at the end of the day. And then there was going to be um, a big discussion um, by all the participants meant to address that question, how does art think? And um, during that uh, whole day, um, there was a gentleman who was taking part. He was the leader of the visual arts workshop. His name was Kit White, and he's an American artist and professor. And he had just written a book called 101 Things to Learn at Art School. And I was so fascinated by what he was saying that day that I promptly went home and I ordered the book, um, which is basically a small book with a series of maxims and guiding principles for artists. And um, each page is, is basically uh, defines a concept in art. And I, and your, the idea was that you, you read a page and then go to bed, you sleep on it, and the next day you read another page. And that's how you're supposed to read the book. And um, as I was reading that book and writing my poems, I, it began to sort of inform uh, the poems that I was working on. And, helped create the framework for the book. This is kind of a long-winded thing, but I, I feel it's important uh, to just set up the context or the framework of the book. So um, just to clarify, the first part of the book, uh, part one, is called Sketchbook, and it deals with the con various concepts in art. So the titles of the poems are, for example, color, uh, light, shadow, etc. And part two is actually This World We Invented, which looks at those principles and then kind of um, develops them in, in various poems. Um, God appears and disappears and reappears in these poems. Um, but basically, uh, the second half is about our flawed world and, um, you know, filled with its rampant con consumerism, uh, religious fanatics, uh, disease, war, and so on. So, um, 
I'd like to dedicate tonight's reading in memory of the country I used to call Canada, now a sad shell of its former self. And um, I'd like to be hopeful and, and dedicate it also to uh, a Canada we can reinvent, another world, a new one to invent. So I'll read a couple of poems from the first section and um, some from the second section. Shape. My ex keeps asking, do I want the cat back? But my place is a wall short, and where, pray tell, to put the litter box? Gets me asking other questions. Where in the dryer does the missing sock go? And to be dead, what's it like? Actually, now that I'm 50, things don't fit so well. My clothes, for instance. But I'm comfortable alone with the cold shot chrysanthemums, picturing myself at the bottom of the food chain, countless nautical miles from consciousness. A sponge in the ancient sea or a hairy primordial cell. Of course, there aren't the familiar reference points. No cities accessorized with cars. Here, it's just me in a different kind of overcoat, brainlessly adrift in the mud-filled swamp. Algae, unaware of love or loss. Words that catch in the back of the throat. Only the pulsing, yes, no, of being here for a time and then not. Scale. Africa was an inch and a half wide on my ruler. The teacher smiled and pasted something into my book, either a gold star or a moth with exceptional markings. I don't recall. She died. Lots of people died. Push pins came off the map, but more went in. Overnight, the population doubled. Where sprightly children once leapt about, there were meaner ones who excelled at games. Tagging a hapless ant with a magnifying glass, harnessing the sun, funneling it into a prick of light, then watching the scrabbling insect shrivel into a seed. It was, of course, the same destiny that awaited Joshua whose miraculous entry into the human race began tentatively on a bed of straw. It isn't any one individual per se, it's the layers of human thought that append themselves to an idea and set its entire life course. Back 2,000 years, blue sky met the ochre sand in a perfect line. It was the wandering shepherd who triggered all the fuss, the celebratory gesturing of his hands. <clears throat> so I have a car, and this car has been a nightmare since the beginning. And when I say a nightmare, you have no idea. This is one of those cars that you come out of being wherever in a store or shopping. You come out and you discover someone's hit it without leaving a note and it happens time and time again. Or I get hit and it's never my fault. So I decided to write a poem in honor of that car. <laughs> it's called Pattern. After years of assorted forgettables, hand-me-downs, rust buckets, gas-guzzling, money-sucking, skyhawks, and monzas, when for the first time I see my Mazda on the lot, brand spanking new, 
All twenty thousand dollars of it without a scratch. Fenders sleek and intact, not a spot of rust on the underbelly. The finest feline within my price range I've ever laid eyes on. It doesn't cross my mind. I'm taking a big gamble. I'm as cool as Catherine Deneuve in the breaking light of dawn, coming home from the all-night casino in a trench coat that Bogart or Jean-Paul Belmondo might wear, pockets stuffed with winnings. I don't ask, so I don't know. How can I possibly know when I lay down my cash and pull the lever, mouth watering in anticipation that the spinning symbols, three perfect lemons, will align just like that, propitiously. Then, within the first month, I'll hit the jackpot again, rammed once, towed twice, and that damned skunk will leave behind its lucky streak all over my faux leather interior. <clears throat> this is called the glass half empty. Things were better in the 40s, but I'm not saying go back to bread and black strap molasses cramping the cupboards of a town where beastly winds rip houses off their foundations, where a mother pregnant for the tenth time spears long johns in a galvanized tub of lye, dips her long-handled fork into the steam and scoops dem Jesus things up for inspection before dropping them back down into the slop. A woman in the half-light bent over cloudy wash water. I'm not saying that. I meant the 50s, when winds colder than Moscow shot through our school. The key was not to faint, but to remain inert under our desks, imagining the fallout of an asteroid half the size of a hockey rink. We really didn't think of dying. But the newsreel looped through the spools of our brains, numbing us until the 60s, when a flash of insight equivalent to a thousand A-bombs detonated over an entire generation. And what we saw, Christ, what we saw of human waste was more than... Uh, I might have been thinking of the 70s, or the 80s, or the 90s or even the first dubious hours of this millennium. Sometimes I think cell phones suck more than anything. <laughs> this is a poem I wrote a uh, week before the Sandy Hook Elementary uh, School shooting. Morning with Paintbrush. The umber wave of morning heaved. I felt nausea only. Outside in tatters, the exhausted grass, gnarled trees in sickly grays. I painted. I painted as the sky choked and summer drained through the cooling soil. I painted through the ghoulish season of pumpkins and corn husks. Through hoarfrost, I painted as the dark snow left handprints on our windows. Color returned me to the earth. The painting intensified. Through the exhaust of cars and their alarming headlights, I painted as the gunmen entered through an emergency door no one had locked. I painted through the sirens and ambulances, through news bulletins and the steady rain of bullets. I painted as the children hid under chalkboards and chairs, as the universe tried to tell me over and over again there are two sorts of human. One is relentless. He sees in his fervor what he chooses to see.
And I'd like to uh, dedicate this poem to my cousin Mark, who's here tonight. I wrote this poem for his late father. Letter to Albert. First, it was the last rites. Then the cadence lull after that storm knocked the socks off Montreal, Toronto, Ottawa, and Prince Edward Island. You in your death wrap are oblivious. Everything bright is covered in snow. I want to apologize for the impoverished day, so little to point to, to honor your leaving. Except maybe the apple on my desk, strangely radiant in its rinse of light. I'm just going to read one more. <clears throat> Dinner party. I want to say to our host, uncorking the Merlot, he's dead right about the narrow channels of the human mind. Another guest drifts back into the conversation. I assume you mean our federal politicians? so earnest with his olive branch. But already we are on to common stupidity, vice, the banal human crimes of our century. We apologize to no one in particular for the discombobulated ecosystem. Chastise the ancient woolly tribes who began on the right foot but trampled the grassy goodness in their protracted spread across the globe. Here, here, goes Olive Branch, waving his scotch. Did we learn nothing from the Titanic? <laughs> Our woozy meanderings keep us afloat until a waterfall of laughter cascades from somebody's wife number three with dazzling toenails and lipstick to match. Her mouth opens wider than her handbag. Funny, up until last week I thought Dachau was in Germany. A monumental hush falls over us, the flickering darkness of a power surge, a sudden drop in wattage. It is so quiet, I can hear the rasping filaments of every light bulb. When the refrigerator comes back on, everyone's talking at once again. Thank you.